This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. We are Game Changer. We build and develop sensors that you can attach to existing gym equipment, such as cardio machines, resistance machines, and free weights to allow members to track their workouts automatically. So right now, gyms have a huge problem with churn rate. Uh, the average is between 30 and 50% of their customers leave them every year. Uh, members who don't come in to work out consistently will eventually cancel their memberships, and that's a loss for both the gym and their health. Studies have shown that workout tracking helps these members maintain a routine. So gym members want to take advantage of technology, and they vote with their phones and their wallets. They switch to gyms that offer a high-tech experience, and they use their phones to track the workouts that they do outside. Mobile app markets are full of popular and highly rated fitness apps. It's clear that people really want to monitor their progress and share it with others. But when you exclude apps that require manual data entry, and you exclude apps that don't work inside a gym, and you exclude apps that can't track weights, there's a void in the market. And that means you end up with this. A quick tour of the UCSB Rexen will show this is still the most prevalent method for tracking weight workouts. It's 2013. This is ridiculous. People new to working out are not going to use this, and current gym rats are tired of it. Enter Game Changer, a system that makes it effortless to track everything you do at the gym. We are able to do what other apps can't because we build sensors that attach to gym equipment. With just three chips, we can detect users, record their workouts, and upload their data to the cloud. For those of you who participated in our demo at the New Venture Fair, will recognize our earlier prototypes. Over the last six months and three revisions, we have drastically reduced our power consumption, size, and cost. We can now build our prototype for $65, and with mass production, we can cut that in half. Our device is flexible enough to work with any gym equipment. It fits in the head of a weight selector pin or the control panel of a cardio machine or on the end of a dumbbell. Here's how seamless and simple tracking your workout can be. Notice how he's not interrupting his workout to use his phone or to write something out on a piece of paper. Once he tags in, Marta doesn't have to do anything. We've completely automated the tracking of his workout. Here's how our system works. When you join a gym, you get a small electronic tag with an RFID chip embedded in it. As you start your workout, the machine reads your tag, tracks your performance as either on a weight machine or free weights, or on a cardio machine, and it uploads it to the cloud where you can view your progress and share it with your friends. Of course, this data isn't just of interest to the members and their friends. Gym owners want to offer services to retain customers and want finer grained analytics data about how their customers work out and what machines they use the most. Doctors and physical therapists want data to see how well their patients adhere to prescribed exercise and rehabilitation routines. And on top of that, simply knowing that your doctor is going to look at your workout means people are going to exercise more consistently and take better care of themselves. As an add-on, 87% of major US corporations offer an incentive-based wellness program with the aim of both reducing healthcare costs and improving their employees' lives. Getting reliable data is integral to any results-based program. And of course, all those other apps that customers love, they can get access to this data too, for a price. Our revenue model. It's based on hardware sales to gyms and recurring fees from the dollar per member we charge to gyms and from corporate wellness programs who will pay us for the validated data we provide about their employee workouts. 
and from app developers and other fitness equipment manufacturers who will pay us for API access. Our solution helps gyms increase membership retention rates. And here's a case study that showcases the benefits. According to the International Health, Racket, and Sports Club Association, for every 1% percentage increase in membership retention, gyms can see a rise in net income of 12%. So, if, so for a gym of 3,000 with a net income of $200,000, if Game Changer can help them raise their membership retention by just five percentage points, they could see a rise in net income of $120,000, which will more than cover the cost of our solution and result in a return on investment of 2.6 to one. Now that's definitely a change in gains. <laughs> we provide this high-tech solution without the sticker shock because we are the only company with sensors that work with existing workout machines. Gyms don't have to buy multi-thousand dollar workout machines, and they don't need to sign expensive maintenance contracts. We plan on charging them an average of $65 per machine and a dollar per member per month. Here's a team that will take on the competition and help increase gym profits. We have a balanced mix of tech, marketing, and business savvy founders. And we have gone job offers from places like Google Incorporated and Wells Fargo Securities. Our market is large and it's growing. The number of health clubs has increased from 12,400 in 1994 to over 29,000. The number of members have doubled from 25 million to over 51 million. And gym revenues have increased from $7 billion to over $25 billion in just, just this past 20 years. Pending approval, we will install our sensors at the rec center over here. A local company likes our idea, and they said they have offered to cover our costs for this testing. After testing, we will target small and medium-sized local gyms. Even though not local, a gym in Vegas called Las Vegas Athletic Clubs liked our idea so much that they have offered to install our sensors at one of their gyms. We plan on expanding to LA and San Francisco by spring of 2014. And by winter of 2015, we will be ready to take on the large chains. We will be profitable by year 2015. And by 2018, we'll have revenue of $75 million, of which 76% will be recurring. And this is based on us having 2,800 gyms, which represents about 9% of the market, and 7 million members in our ecosystem. We ask for $600,000 in funding in exchange for a 25% stake in our company. Funds will be used to cover operating expenses and hardware production costs. Recent m and activity suggests that there will be healthy valuations for exit opportunities. Body Media, a fitness equipment tracking manufacturer with just revenues in the tens of millions, has been acquired by Jawbone for $100 million. By offering the best experience for members and the cheapest upfront costs for owners, we can help gyms keep their cash flows and members healthy. Thank you. So I think we're opening it up for today. Okay, I guess I'll start. Um, great job. That was very uh, unique, and I wasn't quite sure when it's you know a fitness app because as you showed in your first screen, there are so many of those out there. But I think you really presented a differentiated. Uh, Thing, but I want you to go a little bit more into how this works, um, especially with a cardio machine, because I, I understand that somehow it physically figures out how many times you've physically lifted a weight, 
but how does it know the, that I ran three miles? Does that still require input? I just need a little bit more color on what exactly happens when I'm using this at the gym. Sure, uh, so I'm, I did almost all the hardware uh, prototyping. And in 1997, uh, the fitness industry uh, created this standard called C-Safe. And this was uh, mostly driven by one of our competitors, Fitlinks, who they wanted a standardized data format for uh, electronic gym machines. And C-Safe is just a serial data connection, and our chip just has two wires that run into an existing port on the machine. So we just plug in, basically. And this is really, really popular. Like, a sample of the treadmills at UCSB, which are all pretty old, they all have this, all the different models, all the Stairmasters, et cetera. Okay, yeah, because I also wondered, what are the brand names that, that this actually connects with on those machines? But this is this is a standard thing. Yeah, Do you have a percentage of how many uh, uh, machines I don't use have a, C-Safe? I don't have a percentage, but uh, it's most machines produced since 1997. Wow, okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your manufacturing strategy? Where are you guys going to make these devices, or have them made, or where? And uh, so the nice part is right now we have Eagle files and the like circuit layouts for our main components. Uh, with the exception of the RFID chips, we're sourcing the RFID chips from China uh, because they're very low cost and reliable, basically. Uh, the rest. We will probably have manufactured uh, initially in the US in small batches and probably will outsource to China once we have a really finalized design. Have you talked to any uh, subcontractors or anything yet? Uh, not yet. OK, thanks. You indicate a bomb of $65 per sensor and being able to cut that by 50%. Can you talk about? Um, the path to reduce that even further uh, and, and what's embedded in that whole cost? Yeah, so uh, let's see. So there's basically only three components. Uh, so right now there's a microcontroller on the upper right that has an integrated uh, radio and the RFID chip is on the lower right and an accelerometer uh, is the chip in red there. And of those, uh, the RFID reader is about $12 per unit in bulk. Um, and the main cost savings is when we move from uh, the chip on the upper right that has a radio is a, a chip that we purchase right now for about $23 each. Uh, and we don't actually need that chip. It just makes it easy to prototype. So we can just take some of the components off that chip, um, like the microcontroller and the radio, and that will cut the cost of that component from about $25 to about $7. How many chips do you see going into each gym? Um, anywhere from 30 to 700, depending on. I, I, Laura, do you have any numbers? De depending on the, the gym size. So um, a gym with 3,000 members, would say, which would be a medium-sized gym, could have around 100 equipment. Uh, so they would require about 100 sensors, 100 to 130. You're looking at one on each weight stack to replace the weight selector pin, and one on each cardio machine for people to tag in and record data via C-Safe. And then with free weights, one and on every bar? With free weights, there are several options that the gym could take. Depends on how much money or how big of their budget they have. So if they want each dumbbell to, be, to have its own sensor, they can buy the sensors. Or what they could do is just, if they think that only twin members uh, at a time will be using the free weights, so they could purchase 10 sensors and have those members check them out and then by themselves attach it on the freeway. Which would be trivial to do with a magnet. Okay. Thank you. So it seems like uh, success would be very much uh, based on the gyms buying into your retention calculation and the ROI and also the, both the gym and the, and the people working out seeing some really compelling reports, you know, basically screens. And I, I don't know if you've worked on any screens and tested them. Uh, I guess my real question is about how you've tested those two really important things, the retention and ROI and the, the willingness of the gyms to spend the money and also the willingness of the consumer to, you know, spend that extra dollar a month uh, as well. For the retention, the study was from the IHRSA. And the way that gyms can have this 
these gains of net income by just small percent change in retention rates is because gyms have a high operating leverage. So once they hit the break-even point of the amount of members they need to cover their costs. I understand, but, the, I understand the relationship between the ROI and the retention. Okay. It's the relationship between your product and retention that I'm missing. That's why we are testing at the rec center um, so we can develop the statistics and we'll present it to the gyms and that's, that's how we go about that one. And are either of those two gyms gonna spend any money with the product or they're just beta test sites? Uh, Achievement, a local company in the fitness industry, they s offered to cover our costs. So whatever it costs to equip the rec center with our um, trackers, they will cover it. They, um, they're very happy actually with our idea and they said that for years they've been trying to get more tracking in the gyms because there's a lot as you guys see in other areas, but that's why they are offering to cover the cost. And the Las Vegas Athletic Club, would they pay for the sensors or somebody, a third party is gonna cover your cost there as well? Danny was in touch with them and... Yeah, we haven't really finalized. Uh, the impression I got was that we're gonna start off as testing it out in a real gym environment with real customers. And then if they decide to keep it, then we'll enter a paying uh, contract. With Part them. of this also is the fact that anybody spends any money on our competitors, which costs thousands and thousands of dollars, is pretty good validation that people would be willing to spend between like, you know, 1 50th and 1 20th of the cost on our sensors. And when it comes to uh, membership retention rates, on slide, uh, sorry, um, on slide number, uh, 50, please. That one, or which one? All right. Uh, hold it. I'll, I'll choose it. <laughs> oh, no, it's the one next to it. So that one? Oh, sorry. It's uh, this one. Oh, 53. You guys change the slides. There you go. All right, so as you can see, when a member first starts with the gym, they work out two times per week and 57% of them work out three or four times per week. But towards the end of them canceling, it just drops to them working out only less than one time per week and 17% of them work only one time per week. So when gyms have these sensors on them and they can identify who is working out, how much they're working out, then they will be able to target, talk to those members, offer incentives for them to stay. This will help them increase retention rates as well. That sounds awful. If I haven't been to the gym in, <laughs> in six months and I finally come in and then the owner says, hey, you know, you, I, I've been noticing that you haven't been working. I'm kidding. No, I and, understand. And, oh, no. <laughs> as long as they're sensitive about it. Um, um, <laughs> and I mean, you, yeah. And uh, gyms can do a lot of things. They can, uh, by having their members in the ecosystem, they can create challenges. Uh, have groups together that can see, oh, I can, this group burned 10,000 calories per week and they increase their strength by 10%, they're winning. So a lot of things they could do to increase and get, uh, retention. I, I just want to bring up a macro trend here because this is a machine connected device. Obviously this is a technology product, but right now the big trend that I'm personally seeing in my circles, I'm sure you guys all are too, is CrossFit. And that is people working out, using their body weight. That's a massive trend in fitness right now. It, to me, you know, you're saying your competitor is Nordic Track. That's like an 80s, 90s business to me. What do you want to just say about the macro trend? Do you really believe that machines are where it's at in the long term? Uh, well, actually, that's our big differentiator is we work totally fine with free weights. Uh, and really, nobody else does. So we see those uh, kinds of new gyms that are reducing machines as really good for us because it makes us the only player in the market. And also for things like racquetball or um, really any kind of exercise, you can just attach something like this at the door and you just tap in when you start, tap out when you leave, uh, and then we, we can see what you were doing and for how long. Okay. Another thing about CrossFit is CrossFit is like ridiculously expensive and Part of CrossFit is doing Olympic lifts and that sort of thing, which have clear metrics, but it's sort of a pain to record. So if you have your stuff recorded automatically, I think that could probably increase engagement in CrossFit and help people justify paying $150 a month for the gym. And uh, statistics show that 47% of gym members are hardcore um, people who are hardcore workouters. So they work out uh, more than 100 times a year. 
and that represents about 25 million members. So it's definitely a big chunk of the market still there. Thank you. Let's hear it for a game changer. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is David. I am CEO and co-founder of Napsys. So what do we do? We enable the massive and systematic distribution of intellectual property, also known as published material within the academic industry. How do we get there? Well, we started off with the notion that universities move slowly in terms of adapting technology. So as students, we understand the pains that we have because technology is not being properly implemented. So what we did is we got out of the building and we conducted over 320 customer development and market validation interviews and surveys to really understand what the biggest pains are in the academic industry, right? And what we found is that the biggest pains really revolve around this, right? The way in which professors currently distribute information to their students and information that they have to learn, right? So I'm gonna explain this cumbersome illustration to you right now. The way that it works is professors distribute readers to the copy shop. They distribute the information needed to produce readers. They literally photocopy a bunch of information. They send it to the copy shop and then the copy shop produces a ton of them, which they later sell to students, right? Uh, then students obviously pay for them. Now this is a not very convenient system for professors to distribute information, why? The reason is because they have to put all this stuff together and then they have to coordinate with the local copy shops to accommodate for the production and demand of these readers, right? Piles of paper. Now, there are some alternatives and those alternatives include posting material on course management platforms such as Gotcha Space that you guys are familiar with, Blackboard, etc. Now the problem with that is that when professors do that, they actually violate copyright, right? We, we, we are aware of these problems, so we're trying to solve them. Now, do students have problems with this? Yes. Students actually have more problems with readers than professors. Readers are heavy, they're inconvenient, they're expensive. They range anywhere between $15 to $80 a piece. Humanities and social science students this quarter spent on average $100 for readers, and those readers will later end up in the trash can. So we conducted our research and we found out that students, what they really want is they want a digital solution. They want something cheaper. So based on that, we developed our value propositions. What we have is a multi-sided platform with professors as decision makers in this industry and students are the end customers or payers, right? So what we do is we allow professors to distribute digital information. They go on a website, they post the material, and then students get all of this information. They pay a flat rate for the access to this material, right? In terms of a product, what does that mean? All we do is we put together a website where professors drag and drop files from their computer onto the website and these files become instantly available to students on their mobile devices, right? They become available on their phones, tablets, and computers. Now, what happens in the back end, right? Uh, this is a bit cumbersome, but we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go through it. So the idea is that professors submit content to us, which we, go through all of it, and we contact publishers to license the intellectual property that we're gonna be later distributing to students, right? We have 30 days to clear this copyright, copyright information based on the fair use regulation. Very simple, right? Now, there are some competitors that we've looked at. This is a, an existing market. This is not a new thing that we're trying to do. Uh, we have, uh, as a first and major competitor, we have local copy shops scattered all across the country, right? We have uh, the alternative copy shop here at UCSB. We have associated students, and we also have uh, the bookstore, or, or the, the, the USEN, that also sells these readers, right? So these, these, these copy shops are not really offering to students what they need. 
Students want a digital solution, right? And they want the ability to carry this information wherever they go. Uh, we have study.net. Study.net is another, is another competitor, but they're not focusing our target market. They're focusing on business-related courses, right? And, and what they do is they distribute uh, information that is in PDF form. They don't have an application that actually secures the intellectual property from being pirated. The same case is with Harvard Press. They distribute PDFs. They don't have a way to secure the intellectual property. We have StudySoup. Uh, they have an application, but we, we communicate it with them, and they don't have a way to uh, clear copyrighted material, which kind of you know, is not good for expansion and scalability purposes. And uh, we have our typical course management system, Gaucho Space, which does allow professors to upload this material. But uh, a recent lawsuit occurred in 2008 where Georgia State University got sued by Sage Publishers and Associates for having professors post uh, copyright information on the site. We offer all of these solutions, which professors and students have been asking us for. And we work with publishers to develop exclusive relationships with them for their intellectual property. Now, is this scalable? Can we make money out of this? Yes. We have, in, the con in, in this country, we have about 20 million students in higher education. We have uh, assessed that our served available market is composed of all social sciences and humanities students in the US. And this is because they are the ones that buy readers the most. Our target market is going to be composed of a few college campuses in California. And we have assessed that that is going to be about 50,000 students, which we plan to capture within the next three years. And if they all paid us $20 for access to these materials, which is a price that they've also asked to pay for these materials, we would be making about $4.5 million in revenue per year. Sounds great, right? Now, how do we plan to actually expand and gain the customers that we need? Well, we're going to roll out to UCSB first. That's going to be our pilot. We're going to test this, the, the software service platform in our operations. I am glad to tell you that we've actually gained a customer, and we have over 150 students paying $20 for fall of 2013. So we're going to be making revenue with our pilot. Uh, now, uh, our second stage of expansion, <laughs> thank you. Uh, our second stage of expansion is going to be us launch, launching a marketing campaign once we have validated our offering, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna expand to as many universities as we can. We'll show you the graphics later. Now, this is us in comparison to uh, readers today. This is our unit economics. So $20 is a prize that students want to pay for access for one reader. Right? And 30 to $35 is the average price for a reader today. So if we look at that graph, we see that our profits plus the royalty cost that we pay plus the uh, operations of the company, they are less than the operations for a copy shop to actually exist. Right? So in terms of scalability, we got it. We're good. Now. This is our break-even point. As you can see, the hockey stick right there. We, plan, we, we, we projected based on uh, projections of other companies that target the same market, such as Mucho up in the Bay. Uh, we have projected that we're going to break even in 2015. Uh, now, this shows our expansion and, and our revenue expands in profit over the next few years. We are going to be making close to $30 million in revenue in 2018. Now, we're asking the investors in this room to give us $75,000 so that we can actually go and do this and make a lot of money, because we like money. right? And we have tested the market. We have tested the product. We have product market fit. What do you get with that? You get an awesome management team composed of Alex Canedo, our CFO, and myself, you get a sales force headed by Carisha Seen over there. And you also get an engineering team with experience in front end, back end, and design experience. We also have Jim Terzian in the audience today. He is a great sales executive. 
We have Mark Acuno, he is a copyright expert. He was actually in charge of co uh, clearing copyrighted material at UCSB. And if we are profitable, he said, I'm gonna jump in your company and I'm gonna get paid. And we have Ricardo Lizarraga. He is a, uh, he's a software engineer that's been working for about 20, 30 years, creating applications up and down. And that's it. Any questions? Hard to beat the enthusiasm. Hard to beat the enthusiasm of the folks at Napsis. Uh, panel, who wants to start with a question? Uh, I'm just trying to understand how you implement the product. So do you get the professor to agree to distribute this way, or is it a school-wide decision or a department-wide decision? And then the students, are they just basically told they have to pay? I'm so going to take over that question. All right, so the idea is that um, we work with professors. We don't like universities because they, they move slowly, right? So what we do is we go and sell to professors. What professors do is they agree to use our platform, and they force their students to use our platform. That is, cur that, that is a current system, but they're forced to buy paper, uh, and that is, that is actually a much more expensive solution. So we work with professors. Eventually, uh, when we roll out our, our uh, marketing campaign, we are not gonna go, go have to sell to them. We, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, target uh, professor and student communities that have you know, a strong pre presence in the community so we can expand virally. Did that answer your question accurately? How, how, do you, how do you plan to reach individual professors? I mean, I, I would assume that there's at least 150 professors on campus. That's okay. a tough nut to crack yeah, uh, so, with every university uh, from, a, from a cost perspective. Maybe you can how help do we, educate how, me on how you plan to have a profitable sales within. Okay. Uh, so, so what we do is we have a cost of acquisition of $2 per student. So what we do is we have our sales force that works uh, on commission. We, we pay them $2 for every student in the class that they capture. So they go and communicate with professors, and then once they've captured that class, we give them $2 for each student in that class. We are currently communicating with professors in the religious studies and Spanish department to actually capture the entire departments. We're talking to the head departments, and they're very excited. So uh, what we do is we, cap we, we go and talk to uh, you know, high-figure individuals in these departments. And can you tell me about your conversations with publishers about getting this IP? I'd imagine that's not easy, and that's probably why people have a lot of bootleg stuff in their readers now, because it's, it's not easy to, to get clearance for this. I'm sure it's expensive. Tell me how those conversations go. Definitely. So we've talked to several publishers so far. Um, we talked to Sage, which were involved in that Georgia State case. Um, and we've also talked to Penguin Publishing, which is a very large publisher in the US. And basically what they've told us, um, the only restriction that they've given us is that all of the content is kept in a password protected area, which it will be. Um, and they're generally interested in the idea because of the fact that so many um, people are distributing their content currently um, without their consent. So now we are implementing a system that allows them to get paid for, for their dues. All right, so one, one thing we did, we also communicated with uh, the publisher to clear this reader. I forgot to mention that. We actually cleared this reader. So this reader is cleared, and we had to call uh, La Universidad uh, Autónoma de México. Uh, I, I had to pull out my Spanish and talk to them. And they're actually really happy that we're paying them royalties for the distribution of their intellectual property. So we have communicated with them, and this reader is cleared, and we have communicated with other publishers who actually have systems in place for the distribution of their intellectual property. It's just that it, it, it's not, this is a broken system right now. When we went and did all the, the market validation and customer development, we learned that all of this intellectual property is just being distributed in, in a not proper way. Um, another thing is fair use laws also give us some advantages here. Um, we're allowed to use up to 10% of the work without anyone's consent, um, so that means a lot of it will be free, assuming it's less than 10%. And there are a number of copyrights that all copyrights have an expiration date, so any older works will not have to pay any royalties as well. Jim? Um, on the, the expense side, staying on the copyright, so are all the copyright payments fixed for the various materials? and is that system, can you automate that system or do you have to call, call them up? And thirdly, you know, how do you control it if a 
professor just loads the reader up with tons of copyright material. How do you control your expenses on that, on the royalty payments? Okay, so the answer to um, is there any limit on, um, on what they can do is the, the price varies quite a bit. So we're gonna be seeing some works that will be free. We'll be seeing some works that are outrageously expensive and it just depends on the nature of the copyright that was put in place. Um, what we're gonna do to combat that is there's gonna be a cap on the maximum amount of royalties um, that we can pay out for each professor's reader. Um, that way, we don't have the um, situation where one professor decides to put way too much stuff that's probably unnecessary um, and we can you know, keep our costs more in line and not, you know, not have sticky situations. And then how do you automate that? I mean, oh, you okay. guys- So one, one thing that we plan to do is, uh, as you saw on the on the uh, unit economics, we're we're giving them five dollars out of uh, twenty, which is twenty five percent. But we 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 we've determined that 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 is actually going to vary. You know, it's going to go from two dollars to ten dollars, and that is okay. That is something that we're willing to work with because our margins are, you know, usually fifty percent. Um, and, and no, it can't be automated. Um, it, we'll be it, can, need, it can be We'll have to make a lot of phone calls. There are systems that some publishers have where you submit it online, and those can be automated, but we're gonna be dealing with a lot of variability in terms of what and they want from so us. So is that back office expense? In, 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 the beginning, in the beginning, it's gonna be grunt work. It's right, gonna be yeah. us you know, going through this reader and, and looking at the, at the titles and looking at the names of the articles that we have to clear and we're gonna have to call the publishers. Eventually, uh, we, and we actually started like drawing on the board stuff. We, we're gonna put together a search engine, right? It's gonna go through all of the material, it's gonna search keywords, and then it's gonna spit out names of, of content that we have to go and contact. Eventually, we wanna become iTunes for the music industry, or Spotify. For the reader so, industry. For, for the reader industry. Right. So what we do is we provide structure to a, to a broken system. And so are the copyright payments paid per reader sold or are they paid per class or? Per student. Per student, okay. Yeah, so they, 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 publishers do get a lot of revenue out of this and then that, that's why they're excited. Right. Hello everyone, our company, Polyspectra, uses cutting edge chemistry to create advanced optical coatings at competitive prices. We are a collaboration between UCSB and Caltech to commercialize the world's first paintable solution for light filtration. So radiation from the sun comes in a variety of wavelengths, and over 50% of the sun's energy is in the form of ultraviolet and infrared light, which is invisible to the human eye. So billions of dollars are spent every year protecting people and products from this type of radiation. And, sorry, for example, ultraviolet light will deteriorate plastic and wood products that are left outside, and infrared lighting is largely responsible for the solar heating of buildings. So wouldn't it be great if there was one product that could filter out all the unwanted wavelengths of light and let the, let the rest of the wavelengths through? So at Polyspectra, we have created just that product. Um, we've developed a state-of-the-art optical coating that is formed by the self-assembly of alternating plastic layers. So in layman's terms, we've created a smart paint. Um, and as this paint hardens, the molecules in it align themselves to form this multi-layered structure, which will reflect any wavelength of light that we tune it to do. So this is truly the first paintable light filter of its kind. And furthermore, the platform that we use to create this technology is fu fully customizable to reflect any wavelength of light uh, all the way from the infrared through the visible spectrum and into the ultraviolet. So this picture that you're looking at here demonstrates this tunability. These glass vials are coated with all the different parts of the visible spectrum. And then if you look off to the left here, you'd have the infrared light, and off to the right, you'd have the ultraviolet. And so because of the tunability of this, of this uh, coating, it will enable all sorts of applications for reflecting unwanted sunlight. So two of these potential applications are the markets for ultraviolet protection and infrared reflection. Um, our technology would enable a game-changing product in these markets, in these large and established markets. Um, the market for plastic and wood protection stems from the need to protect th plastic products such as paint and wood from ultraviolet degradation, and then the market for infrared reflection 
is stems from the need to put uh, window films and roof coverings on buildings to better insulate them from the sun. So our market research has indicated that there are multiple unsatisfied market needs in these established markets that would give our product a clear competitive advantage. So for now, let's focus in on the market for ultraviolet protection by looking at the root of the problem. As everyone may have noticed, stuff like car paint and uh, plastic furniture gets brittle and discolored if you leave it outside. Maybe you guys have sat on one of these plastic lawn chairs and it just broke out from underneath you because it was, it was so de degraded. Um, this is because ultraviolet light is actually a catalyst for a lot of these harmful chemical reactions that corrode the materials. And so all the different types of plastic and wood products require a different means of ultraviolet protection. And there's really no simple solution right now. Uh, so what's worse is that the, the means of doing ultraviolet protection often affect the material's other properties, such as the color and structural properties. And so if I'm a plastics engineer and I'm trying to find a way to create a product that has a certain color, um, want to use a certain material, it has to have a certain product lifetime, and use a very specific molding technique, it's often very hard to find that combination that also is very stabilized under ultraviolet light. For example, we've talked to a plastic engineer at a company called Poly One, and he was trying to make red stadium seats out of polyethylene. And he was saying, okay, I'm having a really hard time fitting all the consumer specifications and making it fully stabilized. So plastics that are really easy to work with and really inexpensive, like polyethylene and polypropylene, are often not so easy to protect. And they would see a lot higher market share if they could be better protected. So our coating has two major advantages over the competition. One is that it's customizable to almost any surface. And two, it reaches the highest level of ultraviolet protection very inexpensively. So if you compare our product to the most ideal coating available on the market, a zinc oxide coating, it would be six times cheaper and deliver similar performance, if not better. Furthermore, we have the advantage of being uh, the only coating that actually reflects the UV light as opposed to just absorbing it. And we are a recyclable solution, which is gonna add value to the products that we're protecting. So in order to bring this technology to market, we're gonna partner with existing UV stabilizer companies. And these companies are gonna be incentivized to license our technology because it will simplify their product line. They'll be able to reach a wide range of market segments with a single product. And then our customers' customers, these plastic engineers and product manufacturers, are gonna demand our technology because of its low cost and ability to be compatible with anything that they're trying to make, which is gonna help them create better, cheaper products for the consumer. So right now our market research indicates that the uh, customers who express the biggest need for a better UV protecting coating are plastic shingles manufacturers. Plastic roofing shingles are a large and growing segment of the roofing industry, currently represent about 6% of the market. And if someone was to coat all of the plastic roofing shingles being manufactured in the US today, that represents a $566 million opportunity. So our estimated price point for our coating right now would be very competitive in this market, and we'd have the added advantage of being environmentally friendly and provide very long-lasting color protection, which are both major selling points for roofing shingles. We like to call our business model chemistry as a service because we focus on what we do best, which is chemistry. So that means we're responsible for developing the technology into a market-ready product with proven performance and scalability. So by first proving the success of the product, of this product, we will be in the position to negotiate very favorable licensing deals with these large chemical companies who will do the heavy lifting of actually manufacturing and distributing the product. These type of licensing agreements are very typical for specialty chemical companies such as us. Uh, so currently our timeline shows that we're gonna spend a year working at the Caltech labs doing product development, and then we're gonna, bend to, we're gonna begin to start scaling our product in year two by partnering with a company, a polymer company in Los Angeles called Materia, which was actually founded by one of our advisors and has been working closely with our lab group at Caltech for a while. So because we are introducing a very competitive product into a large market, our licensing business model will be very profitable. So if we capture 8% of the addressable market by 2018, 
and then take 10% of the additional profits that our licensees um, see from using our product, if we take 10% of that as royalties, we'll have revenues of about $20 million by 2018 with 60% operating margins. So we estimate that we need about a million dollars to get through Series A, for Series A funding to get through the product development phase, and then another $2 million in Series B to start testing our product on scale and securing these licensing agreements. And then once the UV coating part of our company has matured, we will look to get acquired by a large chemical company. And then we can, uh, so these companies such as uh, Dow, BASF, DuPont, all have venture capital branches and are, are very interested in acquiring specialty, com specialty chemical companies that complement their existing product line. Uh, then we can begin to develop the other applications of our, of our chemical platform, such as the infrared reflecting window films and roof coatings, which we were talking about earlier. We can also get into the market for building optical filters for lab research. And we can even develop an all plastic fiber optic cable using this chemical platform. So a very chemical, a very capable team of students and advisors has been assembled to start this company. This team consists of the PhD students and postdocs at Caltech, as well as UCSB students, including Eric Danner, Aidan Fenwick, and myself, Paul Weidekamp. We are advised by several professors who have all already started their own technology companies. Uh, namely, Robert Grubbs, who is a Nobel laureate and the founder of our partner company, Materia. Um, so because of the clearly recognizable potential of this technology, we've already received a $175,000 research grant from Dow Chemical and the Resnick Sustainability Institute just to work on commercializing this research. We've also filed two patents on the polymerization strategy to make our product and the applications of it. And our team has already competed in a large regional competition sponsored by the Department of Energy, and we made it all the way to the finals. So I've told you all about Polyspectra and how we're going to revolutionize the UV protection market and provide a profitable path uh, for our investors. And I would like to thank everyone for listening and open up the floor for questions. Go ahead and take a seat. We'll bring everybody else on stage. There you go. Okay, panelists. How many of you remember your organic chemistry? Uh, <laughs> somebody start. So it uh, looks fantastic. Uh, do you have to wait until the patents are granted before you start conversations with potential licensees? Um, so the way that we're thinking this is going to work is that we filed the patents earlier this year. It usually takes uh, a year or so to get those patents filed, at which point we will get an exclusive license from Caltech to start, um, to start relicensing it to the, the uh, other bigger chemical companies. So in the meantime, we're going to be working on the product development stuff and the product proving so that when we get to the point where we're ready to start licensing this, this technology, we'll have a proven product that's ready to just drop into the market. Can you just give us a, some idea of what proof of concept has been done already on the material? Right, yeah. So we've coated, we've coated multiple different surfaces with, um, with a coating that reflects UV light with up to about 90% rejection right now. We think we can get it better when we clean up the chemistry. As you saw in that picture, there's all those glass vials that show the tunability of these coatings so we can hit any different wavelength we want. Um, and then we're working right now to develop the spray-on application, kind of getting the flow rates right and making it nice and uh, friendly for some sort of manufacturing process and, the, and making it uh, stronger, more uh, abrasion-resistant coating. So with the, at the risk of monopolizing the floor, there's one thing I've got to know is if I'm sitting on this chair with the reflective coating, am I going to get totally fried? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't think you would get any more, that much more UV than you would already get just sitting outside. Well, th thank you for clarifying that the chair that I broke was because of sun degradation and not my weight. <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, but, but getting into um, some of the polyethylene uh, seat example you gave, is this something that you would coat the stadium seats with or would it be mixed in at the manufacturing process? Right, so uh, let me explain a little bit more how the, this problem is solved currently. Uh, right now, there are a lot of compounds called UV absorbers or antioxidants, which are often infused into the plastic before you even mold the product. And so that's the current solution. And you need a kind of a different mix of these things for every different type of plastic and color that you're working with. 
uh, ours would be a coating that goes on the outside after the product's already manufactured and molded. Um, we're not the only type of coating available. There, there are situations, especially where the color is very critical in your product, where you have to go as far as coating it. But ours would kind of supplant all those, all those different solutions and just be the one size fits all coating that will work for any, uh, any surface. Uh, one more question with the, uh, the impact of um, shingles for, for roofing. If you coat the EnviroShake shingles, um, and you're reflecting you know, UV or infrared uh, spectrum there, the color's gonna last, that's, that's one of the, uh, the, the components you're, you're pushing, but what about the thermal input? Are you able to reflect heat with this as well to drop your HVAC bills? Right. Uh, I mean, that would be the next generation. Uh, okay. So the heat that is being absorbed into the roof, it comes from the infrared. And so that is, when you look upon the, uh, the tunability of it, uh, developing the ability to uh, reflect that infrared is what we were trying to refer to when we were discussing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's something we can already do. We can get those infrared wavelengths. That, that product is, is something that we could, we could start working on that market pretty soon as well. We just thought that the UV was a bigger opportunity, so that's what we focused on right now. I, I guess my involvement in energy leads me towards uh, the infrared side of things. Right. That's, so, that's a so massive when we, market. If yeah, you, when we did really this uh, Department of Energy com competition, it was specifically for clean tech ideas, and we focused the business plan solely on an infrared reflecting product because it's an energy saving play. Mm -hmm. And you can coat your windows and roofs with something that reflects infrared and everything stays cooler, you save on your energy bills. We thought that this UV market would be a lot bigger and more profitable for this competition, so we focused on that. Well, okay. Also, the beauty of this product, too, is its tunability to any wavelength. So, I mean, like we said, we focused on UV for this one just because it's a big market, but you could even do colors. You could reflect the you know, visible spectrum of light all the way up to infrared, so uh, the, it's got a wide range of possibilities with applications. But al along those lines, can you reflect both IR and UV? Or do you have so you to mean choose like simultaneously? One? Yeah, choose one or the other. There's actually, there's actually uh, one form of this technology where you would be able to. It's, um, so if I have one peak in the IR, you're gonna get what's called a second harmonic peak in a lower spectrum. And it actually works out pretty well that if we put one peak in the IR, the harmonic is in the UV. So it, it, with one product, we would get both IR and UV reflection. One thing, but yeah, so it, kind of just by mixing an IR reflecting coating with a UV reflecting coating, you can kind of, you can hit both. Okay. And then, um, so the, the royalty, the 10% royalty, is that standard in the chemical industry for this type of additive yeah. or something We've like that? We've consulted multiple chemical engineers who have done these sort of licensing deals. So what you, the typical deal is you take 10% of the value added. Right. So if, if I'm a chemical company and I license some product, how am I gonna benefit? Like if I capture some percent of the market and then I have 10% profit margins on that, that 10% profit margins is my value added. And there, there goes more into that too. Like say I have a, I get higher market share. Some companies value market share more than anything and so that will be value added. And then what percentage do you pay Caltech? Uh, the typical licensing agreements that, that they, they do right now is about 3%. Okay. And that's factored into the financials. Colleen? Go, I've, yeah, um, <laughs> this isn't my complete realm but the only thing that kind of stands out to me is that if there are a lot of companies already that are incorporating UV protection in their materials earlier on in the process, not as a coating after the fact, um, do you have any idea of what percentage of the market, say, of stadium seating does that already, and then how long it would take them to change, even if it's gonna cost them less money, how long it's gonna take them to change their entire manufacturing process to instead do it afterwards with the UV painting? Right, yeah, and that, that's the million dollar question. So this $12 billion pie is broken up into some part coating, some part infusing before the, pra the product is even made. Um, what we've done for our financials right now, because that question is pretty hard to answer, is we've looked at specific market segments that already use a coating because the, the color of their product is so critical and they're offering you know, 50 year warranties on it. It's gotta be, keep its color that long. So that's the, uh, the, the the addressable market that we've been looking at, and that's how we derived our financials. Okay. Um, so, so in that sense, we could plug right into the existing manufacturing process because they're already doing some sort of coating technique. Okay. And this only works with plastic or wood; it doesn't work with glass. 
Well, no, actually, I mean, our product's on glass. It is on glass. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's okay. the idea is that not only is the wavelength tunable, but the ability to adhere to different surfaces is tunable. Okay. Is there uh, just a quick moderator question? Um, we're in the state of California, so two issues. One, does the state, do any state agencies give you a certification that could give you a competitive advantage in California over others? And number two, since you're doing this under both Caltech and UCSB, if you owe licensing money or if you have licensing agreements with the two universities, how do you split that up if you're wildly successful? Yeah, the technology is completely owned by Caltech. The UCSB team, uh, we are here to help develop the business side of things. Um, the first question, there are a couple rebates already in place for these window films. You can get you know, a large fraction of your window film paid for because it is an energy saving option. So that that's, just brings down the cost to uh, the end consumer. Um, as far as the, the product as a whole, since it is got this environmentally friendly aspect to it, I'm not quite sure about how the rebates work, but that might help. Do, do you have an exclusive license on the technology from Caltech? So we're, we're in negotiations right now, because the patents were, were just filed earlier this year. We have, to, we have to wait until they have actually been granted to uh, secure exclusive rights. But the tradition at Caltech is the inventors, half of which are on our team, um, the inventors of the patents usually get the first go at the, licensing, the exclusive licensing agreement, and then they get a certain amount of time to run with it and see if they can make it profitable. It seems like one of the big features of this product is the longevity. Um, have you done any accelerated life testing or anything to see if these coatings actually maintain their adherence and their, their properties over time? Yeah, so we have a, a xenon um, light source in our lab and we do the accelerated testing trying to protect products from UV fading and showing how the unprotected side is, is uh, is going to last longer than the protect, or sorry, the protected side's lasting longer than the unprotected side. So yeah, we've done that accelerated testing already. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for Paulie Spector. <laughs>